Well, tonight, continuing in the theme of what we did this morning, I want to preach to you a sermon called Look to Your Great High Priest. And again, this morning, we talked about the purification of the conscience. We talked about the Old Covenant and how it was unable to do that. It was external and ceremonial in nature, but the blood of Christ is a sacrifice that can cleanse our very souls, even our conscience. So tonight we're continuing in Hebrews chapter 9 because there is a fountain filled with blood where we can lose all our guilty stains. And the second half of this chapter that we just read continues in this glorious truth. And again, like this morning, I have uh, four goals for this sermon. One is just to help you understand what this passage is actually saying. Second is to remind us of our need for purification. Third, is to pay attention to what it actually cost us to be purified. And fourth, most importantly, I want to put your eyes on your great high priest and what he is doing at this very moment on your behalf. When I say look to your great high priest, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So, as we just read, we realize he is a mediator of a new covenant. Now, we didn't cover this this morning, but in chapter 8, it's all about the new covenant. And the new covenant comes with better promises than the old covenant. Eternal promises. And so, the, the old covenant is gone is what he's telling them. The new is here. And so the first, five, the first few verses, verses 15 through 22, which we'll go through pretty quickly, is like a parenthesis in the argument that we started this morning, th th that he's making. It's a parenthesis to point back to chapter 8 to remind us that there's a new covenant and how this new covenant had to go, come into effect. And then we'll spend most of our time looking at the remainder of this and looking at our high priest. So look at verse 15. Of this first section, this is probably the verse we'll spend the most time on. Verse 15 says, Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. That was the, the better promises listed in chapter 8. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from transgressions committed under the first covenant. Now notice this. Christ here is spoken as a mediator. And that's important. We're used to that phrase. But what a mediator implies is that there are two parties in conflict. That is the role of a mediator, to seek peace. God is holy and man is sinful. There is a separation. Sinful man is at enmity with God. And so some people will want to try to downplay all this idea of needing uh, that God and man, God just loves everybody. Well, the whole idea that Christ is a mediator says, no, there is a problem. And so Christ mediates between sinful man and God. And he does it by establishing a new covenant with new promises that are different than the old. Did you notice what it said? That they may receive an eternal inheritance. These are better promises. The old covenant was temporary. It gave you ceremonial cleanliness and things like that. But this is an eternal inheritance. Really what he's getting at, if you pay attention to the flow of the argument through 6, 7, and 8 chapters, you will realize he's talking about eternal life. See, one of the problems he says earlier with the old covenant was that people kept leaving it. But when you read about the new covenant, and he quotes Jeremiah there, and you read it in Jeremiah, and you read it in Ezekiel, you'll find that he says, I will write my, uh, with my spirit, write my words on their heart, and they will not depart from me. So he's already saying, look, when you become a believer, this is an eternal salvation. You can't lose it. And so this is all part of the covenant and the idea of a covenant had to come into play. And the only way that could happen was with a death. 
a death has occurred that redeems us. And obviously we know that's talking about redeeming us from our transgressions and the wages of sin, which is death. But notice, it also included the transgressions committed under the old covenant. All who will be saved, Old Testament or new, are saved by the blood of Christ. Look at that verse there really quick. It said, at the end of 15, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. It even, it, it, we know it saves us from our sins, but it even saved those for the sins that were committed in the first covenant. This will come into play as we keep moving. Verse 16, starting to move a little quicker here. For where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. So why does he switch here to will? It, we're talking about covenants and things like that. It seems odd that he just makes this transition and to now start talking about wills. But we're talking about an old covenant. And the word that is used here is testament. And testament is pretty much the same word they would have used for will. So when we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're talking about these covenants that God has made with man. So he, he moves in to give this illustration. He says, look, a will does not take effect until a death has occurred. And by the way, neither do the covenants that God makes with sinful man. Verse 17, for a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. So a will requires uh, two people. It requires a testator, the one who says, here are the promises, here is the inheritance I am going to give. And then it also requires an executor, that once that person dies, the, the person who wrote it can't be the executor because they're dead. The executor then must enforce it. So, uh, we have this. And a will, the important part here is a will or the inheritances or the promised gifts that come through this testament cannot be binding unless there is a death. Verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. So we know that about the New Testament, but God didn't even have a, a covenant in the Old Testament that he did not require blood. By the way, you can look from the very beginning. Adam and Eve sinned, and what's the first thing they do? It covers them with skins. An animal had to die to cover their nakedness. Every covenant throughout the Old Testament is done in blood. Death must happen. Verse 19 for when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and the people. So what he's doing now is he's pointing us back to Exodus 24. Moses had been given the law and the, and the covenant is being inaugurated. They killed the animals and they sprinkled everything. Even the scrolls upon which the covenant, the word of God was written upon. And the people. So again, the testament is, even in the Old Testament, I'm going to promise to be with you. I'm going to do all these things for you. I'm going to give you the land. But in order for me to deal with sinful men, death has to happen. Verse 20. So Moses, here's the picture. Moses is doing all of this. And Moses says, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. Again, this passage is primarily from Exodus chapter 24. But if you read Exodus chapter 24, he kind of plays with the language just a little bit. And it's interesting what he does. It's almost identical but when you read that, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. If you're like me, the first thing that came to mind is the Last Supper. Jesus says, this is the blood, or this is the covenant I make with you in my blood. He is, in a sense, kind of mixing those two together because he wants to show us and he wants to show the readers that it's one and the same. Both covenants require death, require blood. 
Verse 21 and 22 say this, And indeed, in the same way, he sprinkled the blood, both uh, the, with the blood, the tent, and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Why? Here comes the clincher. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. All of that done, all that blood sprinkling, all those sacrifices, in order for a covenant to stand, and the reason we need this is because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, and without forgiveness, there is no covenant of God with sinful people. It's really interesting, Spurgeon points this out, that he uses the negative here. He could say, and he does in many other places, that the blood washes us clean. But here he uses the negative. There is, if there is no sacrifice, if there is no death, there is no forgiveness of sin. If you do not accept the sacrifice of Christ, you do not have forgiveness. There's no other way to get it. There is no status you can attain in this life. You could be the prince, a king, a queen. If you don't trust in the sacrifice of Christ, there is no forgiveness of sin for you. There are no works you could do. You could do all these great things, helping the poor, doing all of this. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And this is an eternal truth. It's not like, oh, this was an ancient truth that applied to them, but now things are different for us. No, this started at the beginning. At the fall, blood had to happen, and it still has to happen. R.C. Sproul was once preaching on uh, the sacrifice of Christ and blood needing to be atoned and someone came after him and goes, you know what I don't like about your gospel and your Christianity? It's so primitive. It's not sophisticated and enlightened. And he goes, and that is a gift from God that it is so primitive anyone can understand it. Death has to come. And so the point of all this is that the, the old covenant was inaugurated with blood and so is the new. And like a will, the old held out promises, but the new covenant holds out better promises. It holds out an eternal inheritance, an eternal life. It holds out true access to God himself that the old never did. And again, but these promises, if you want them, they cannot go into effect without death until Christ dies. And know this, Jesus is both the testator and the executor of this covenant because he still lives. So there is no remission without the shedding of blood. But in making that statement, he is saying, but there is a way. There has been blood that has been shed. You can have forgiveness. And so this is where we move into the last section. The ministry of the great high priest. So in starting in chapter 8, he's been building this argument. Like, you know, the priest actually did work. They offered gifts in the Old Testament, the blood sacrifices and all that. Well, Christ is doing the same thing. And this is really where he comes to the climax of his argument. What is Christ doing? What is he doing as he ministers in the true heavenly heavenly throne, the true holy of holies? Well, he's going to tell us. Verse 23. But it was necessary for the copies of heavenly things, remember the Old Testament things are just copies, to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. So once again, just a reminder, the Old Testament worship worked copies of heavenly heavenly realities when we look at the old holy of holies we are looking at a picture of the true holy of holies and we learn from them even though they could not save us God used them to teach us 
to teach us what it means to be redeemed by Christ. But there is a true heavenly uh, holy of holies in heaven. And to enter that, for sinful man to be redeemed in that, requires a better sacrifice than the blood of bulls and goats. Verse 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. This is a glorious verse. This is the point of my sermon tonight. If you get anything out of this, when I say look to your high priest, this is what I want you to get. Christ did not go into the tabernacle made with hands. He entered heaven, the very throne of God. And notice it says, now to appear. That was present tense when the author of Hebrews wrote it, and it's present tense now. He is actually there at this moment. Your high priest, a fully man and fully God, representing you in the heavens, in the, in the heavenlies. Notice what it says. It says, in the presence of God. What does that mean? Well, the word presence there in Greek is prosopon. It literally means countenance or face. Christ is before the face of God. No priest who ever entered the Old Testament, uh, Holy of Holies, did that. It would have killed them. Moses said, Show me your glory, and said, I can't. It'll kill you. You're too sinful. Go hide behind a rock. You'll see the backside, the trail of my glory after I pass. And that's about all you can handle. Isaiah saw, got a glimpse of, uh, in a vision of the throne of God. And it was just a vision. It wasn't the actually. And he said, woe to me, I am undone. But Christ is there. Before the face of God. And why is he there? Because it says if you're a Christian, he is there on your behalf. He is presenting the sacrifice for your sins. Fully God, fully man, you have a representative in heaven before you. And he is finding full acceptance at this moment. I'll explain more as we go here, but let's look at verse 25 and 26. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundations of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So again, he's, he's laying out this better sacrifice. Why is this a better sacrifice than anything that has come before? One, he didn't have to die repeatedly. Bulls and goats had to be offered repeatedly, but not him. His sacrifice was so pure and so right that he appeared once for all and stayed in the holy places. His sacrifice was pure. It was perfect. One time counted for all eternity. When Christ was on the cross and he said, it is finished, he meant it is finished. If his sacrifice was not sufficient for all eternity, he would need to offer it repeatedly. But notice what it says in this verse. He wouldn't have to just start offering it repeatedly from the time that he died on the cross going forward. He would have had to start suffering repeatedly since the foundation of the world. That's the end of verse 26. That's when he would, he would have had to start suffering at the fall 
or those people couldn't have been saved. But we just read at the beginning of this that his sacrifice not only saves everybody going forward, it saved everybody back, going back. So he doesn't have to suffer repeatedly. So what does he appear before the, the, before the face of God himself, the Father, to do? And why did he do this? He did it to put away sin. To put away your sin. To put away my sin. If you're a Christian and you're trusting in the shedding of blood that Christ did for you, your sins are gone. They are annulled. Legally, against you, they no longer exist. You're no longer under the law's condemnation. You are now under grace. All those things you wish you never would have done. And I could start listing off a list of all kinds of sins, but I don't need to because you know the ones that bother you. You know the things you think back to and you shake your head at yourself sometimes. My friends, his sacrifice washed it all away. Once for all. He did not bring just any sacrifice before the face of God and is now presented there in the Holy of Holies in heaven for you. He brought his own blood. It says he brought the sacrifice of himself. And Christ stands there and says, I represent my children, those who are trusting in me. I have washed them clean. Picture Christ before the face of God right now. See him accepted and you are seeing your own acceptance in him. Verse 27. And just as it is appointed once for man to die once, after that comes the judgment. So now he's going to bring it around to brass tacks here. He said, look, it's appointed for every one of us to die. That word appointed is important. It's not going to happen accidentally. It is appointed. God has appointed. He has predetermined. It is set in stone. There are only a few exceptions of people who will not die. Enoch, a couple of, of, from the Old Testament, and those who may be alive at his return. But everyone else, it is appointed that you will die. Not only is the exact time of your death appointed, but also the manner in which it will happen. You are going to die. I am going to die. And after that, the judgment. We don't go into oblivion. We don't cease to exist. We go to the judgment. And for those who are not in Christ, they will face the wrath of God for their sins. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And if they're not trusting in what Christ did, they bear the wrath themselves. Think about this. We have been talking about how the bulls and goats and all these sacrifices pointed to who Christ is and what he did for us. But in this regard, for those who will not trust what Christ did for them, every bull, every goat, every uh, you know, a burnt offering, and that's really key, burnt offering, is a picture of their judgment. Jesus on the cross is a visible manifestation of the wrath they will face. And that image of his body dying on the cross with the nails and the, and the blood pouring out is only part of it. It cannot show you the internal and spiritual torment that Christ faced when God the Father spiritually poured out his wrath for sins upon Jesus Christ. It's the torment of a soul unpurified. 
a conscience never wiped clean for all eternity, bearing its own sin and guilt. A lot of people have this picture of, of people in hell thinking, oh, now I get it. Why, did I, why didn't I follow God? No, the picture is in hell it will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does that gnashing of teeth mean? It doesn't just mean agony. It doesn't mean torment. It means hatred. They will live with unpure conscience and unredeemed souls and their hatred for God will manifest for all eternity. Wrath for all eternity. Why all eternity? That seems a little harsh. That seems a little long. When a finite being sins against an infinitely holy God, there is only one punishment that is suitable, and that is an infinite punishment. Now, some people say, but wait a minute. I thought you're saying Christ covered our infinite wrath in a matter of hours on the cross. Yes, because Christ himself was an infinite being. And he can take an infinite wrath. But for humanity who don't take that sacrifice, they will face it themselves and it will never be complete. Verse 28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So now he, he, he's shown us three appearings of Christ in this passage in chapter 9. First, the appearing when he showed up on earth to put away sin. The second, he is now appearing in the presence of God. Your high priest is there on your behalf. But he's going to make a third appearing to come back here. Notice what it says. He did offer, uh, praise God, Jesus did bear the sins of many. And he's going to return a second time. But this time, he won't come to deal with sin for those who trust in him. Because for those who trust in him, the price has already been paid. It was an eternal payment. He is returning to save us. So in closing, I leave you with this. I'm not sure what you've got to face this week. Some of you are dealing with very difficult health problems. Some of you are dealing with real issues at work. Wondering, will I even have a job in the coming weeks? I did something wrong. I messed up. I, I've got people who are after me at work. They don't like me, and so they're coming against me. Some of the things you may face are good. Some of you have got very difficult decisions to make with family members. and uh, uh, Just so many things weighing you down. But this is what I want you to know. If you have trusted in Christ alone, you have a high priest at this very moment before the face of God. He has presented himself in the sacrifice he said and said, that man is my son. That woman is my daughter. I have washed them. They are mine. And the father looks at that sacrifice and sees him and sees you in him. And he says, their sins are no more because a death has occurred. And that eternal inheritance is theirs no matter what they face in this life. They already have eternal life. When I gave them new spiritual life, that was an eternal life that began at that moment and that will never die again. And they are co-heirs with you, my son. Now there's one other thing not covered in here that the Lord is doing for you in the presence, in the face of God. He is your intercessor. He is also praying for you. Are you really worried about that meeting tomorrow? Your sins are cleared. And the Lord has prayed for you. If you want to know what he's praying, just read John chapter 17. 
John chapter 17 is when he prays for his disciples and he clearly says, and I'm not just praying for the disciples that I have on my earth now, but those who will follow after, that's you and me. And he says, Lord, this is the Father. He says, look, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. They're gonna face their hardships. They're gonna face their difficulties. But I'm praying that you keep them and that you not lose them and that they come home with me eventually. And that is a prayer that is guaranteed to be answered in the affirmative. My friends, all of your sins, if you're looking to Christ, have been washed clean. And they are eternally clean. Look at your high priest before the face of God representing you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we once again thank you for your word. We thank you that there are, we, we cannot exhaust it. We cannot, I mean, we could spend going over these same passages a hundred more times and find more and more insights and more and more truths that you're telling us. We've only scratched the surface today. But Lord, we thank you that you have washed us clean. Not only have you washed us clean, that you've purified our conscience. We thank you that you have, uh, uh, you're in the presence of your Father at this moment and that we are accepted in you. We thank you that you continue to pray for us. Lord, help us to have faith. So much of our doubting, so much of our concerns, and so much of our anxieties are because we are not looking at you the way we should look at you. Help us to see you. Help us to see you in the presence of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen.